to the experimental results. So first, I talked about the task of identifying the structures, um, those the relationships of dependence in the data. And they evaluated on a few artificially generated data sets. And the algorithm's performance, you can see here, see the structure. Where in the cases where there were these structures in the data, it clearly assigned a lower score, score being the uh, MMB. And it also did pretty well in identifying chain structures. For cause effect inference, the algorithm was evaluated on five different data sets, drawn from both real world as and artificial examples with hundreds of pairs of causal relationships. And the comparison was made against some constraint-based, score-based method, methods, placing certain um, functional form restrictions on causal relationships. And the standout performance was really on the Tumingen data set. So data from finance, climatology, from the university uh, that was part of a challenge on causal inference put on by the University of Tübingen. But that was the one example where the CGNN really outperformed um, some of the existing methods. But you can also see that it took some time to train on a uh, GPU. And that was training on about 10 thousand samples. And then, so the last example was the bivariate case, um, disorienting like an A cost of This is the converse. But in the case of 20 variables, then they evaluated on some artificial data in two cases. One, where you provide the algorithm with the true skeleton. This was artificially generated data, so you know exactly what those relationships of dependence are. And also where there was 20% of error in the skeleton. So what that means is in a skeleton of, I think it was about 50 edges, or, or there about 10, yeah. Uh, in a skeleton of 50 edges, about 10 of them were either reversed or removed, some kind of noisiness was added and they evaluated how well the model was able to generate from the distribution, um, even in that circumstance. And the cases that I have in the box are the cases where the CGNN uh, with the MMDK score was the top performing algorithm of the ones considered. Um, again, tested against constraint-based or pairwise in terms of training time, it took four hours on the GPU versus the PC HSIC, which is one of the more powerful constraint-based or conditional independence testing algorithms that took 15 hours. They also tried scaling it up to graphs with 100 variables, and training the CGNN took about 30 GPU hours. And I guess for comparison, the paper talked about trying to run the same PC algorithm and it, they just gave up after 50 hours of trying to train on CPU. So, against the most expensive of previous state-of-the-art <laughs> algorithms, it seems to have some cost savings, but it's still by no means a very efficient way of learning causal relationships. Did you say what those columns are? AUPR is Oh, sorry. Yeah. So AUPR is here the area under the precision recall curve. I was having a discussion about exactly how they computed it, and they were not very transparent. My guess is that they looked at different thresholds on your confidence score. So if I have a graph, if I have just the graph that I learned, that's one point on my um, AUPR curve. And then if I say I need to be this level of confident in my edge, then that will generate another point. And that's how I think they were able to generate that curve of precision. Um, how often did I 
how often was I correct at orienting an edge given that I said there was an edge? This is recall. How many of the edges did I actually get? Did you, okay, you may have said it, but I'm trying to understand. How do you mix the two? Uh, Pardon me? How do you mix it? So you have, um, so your curve. Yeah. Is it going to be like one axis to precision, the other axis? Would you recall, recall and then repeat the area? Is this? Uh, yes. Yes. So one axis would be precision, the other recall. And my hypothesis is that they set different thresholds on the confidence score to generate points along the curve and compute the area under that curve as a measure of how well it fit at different levels of confidence. Gotcha. The second metric is the structure, structural Hamming distance, I believe. And it's a measure of, well, we know what the true skeleton is and we know the graph that um, the algorithm produced. How many changes would it take to get the true graph from the graph that we produce? And so that's what it's measuring. Um, for example, two and a half on average, based on testing the algorithm over, I think it was 32 different runs. And 32 runs because this is artificial data, so they generated these 20 graphs 32 times and then averaged the scores. And the SID is a measure of how many two variable interventions the algorithm got right. So like x1, x2 causes some x3. How many times were those types of relationships correctly identified in the model that you fit? So uh, that's SID, right? E oh. Yeah. And it's saying uh, fifty point four five. So is the forty five in brackets the number of uh, relationships that correctly identified? Uh, no. The fifty point four five is the number of relationships. I forget it. Exactly, what the brackets are here. Um, okay. It, it's in the paper, so yeah, I, I could get you the answer after. Sure. Is it variable or something? In this case, I don't think it was the standard deviation. In previous um, evaluation tables, they did, but I don't think it was for this one. But I could be wrong. Um, uh, all the other, all the other methods they listed there. Yes. Are there any call it neural network based method? No. And that was part of the novelty of this paper is if we say our calls mechanism is a neural network, then how well does it perform? And so are we able to train it? Is that also the key contribution? One of the key contributions? Yes. Yes. Uh, do they do any experiments with purely spurious data? Purely spurious. No. So the question would be, you have some data that uh, has correlations in it, but there's spurious correlations, and you want to know how much structure it imposes on it. Interesting. There was never, there weren't any experiments done on purely spurious, but in the case where the skeleton was noisy, um, one of the notes was that the false edges were assigned low confidence scores, whereas the real edges were given high confidence. So right. that's their statement on the robustness to like spurious relationships existing in your hypothesis on how the data is structured. Are there any more questions? And I put the quote from Box on all models are wrong, but some are useful. Just to emphasize that all models do need to be taken with a grain of salt. Causal inference does make some assumptions and try to extend associational 
or classical methods, but because the word cause is in there, it can lull you into a sense of complacency. You do have to be critical of what you actually find in the model. Key takeaways from the paper, well, CGNN does a good job of learning causal relationships. It had robust performance on both real data or given the noisy skeleton. And you're able to fit a generative model to simulate if you fix some variable in your system to a value, um, how that would propagate through the other variables and what you would expect to observe. Uh, the cons, the model was pretty sensitive to the number of neurons and it goes back to the problem of identifiability where if you fit too complex a neural network to that relationship you may be unable to uncover what that causal orientation is as well as the expensive search algorithm that seems like it could be optimized. And that brings me to the discussion point. So, through the talk, there were a couple more discussion points on, for example, the choice of distribution. Um, but some of the thoughts that Masood had put together were whether it was possible to have a better causal graph searching algorithm in score-based methods. So, for example, gradient-free optimization or Bayesian optimization for better sampling. Um, another one was whether certain graph structures, for example, if your graph happened to be somewhat bipartite, would that help you parallelize the searching algorithm by searching over subgraphs, optimizing locally, and just, well, even any way of parallelizing the process, since currently the global search just makes it very, um, very expensive. Uh, but I guess, now I'm opening it up for discussion. So what's the answer to these questions? <laughs> <laughs> I am not too familiar <laughs> with the gradient free, but I know there are definitely methods within combinatorial optimization that focus on searching over these sort of exponential st structures. So between any two variables in your graph, it would be two to the d possible edges in a complete graph. And so my feeling is that there have to be better ways of doing it. One proposed was a taboo search, or tabu, that I'm not familiar with. Um, but I don't have like a specific algorithm that I would apply. So <coughs> I guess I can ask comparative questions. That I, yeah. So there is like the problem of searching for graphs is very common in chemistry, right? Like they, like when, when they're trying to do drug discovery, like we had a talk, uh, Roosevelt presented that uh, they use generative models to generate different molecules that could have different certain properties. So I'm curious if uh, any of the methods or what methods do they use for searching the graph space because they have the exact same problem. Does anyone have a background in graph searching for drug discovery? <laughs> Should we get others? <laughs> I mean, I think that, that talk was they use, a, uh, they use RNNs to generate sequences um, of uh, sort of relationships in the nodes of the graph, like where to go next. Yeah. Um, and they, I think they had some way of evaluating it. Does it look legit or not? Could you go back to the algorithm slide, please? I may have, I may have missed this. So the, the initialization is a power orientation is not randomly. Uh, sorry. It would be initialized as the skeleton. I 
could have made that more um, explicit. So it's initialized and directed, and then step one, you start putting direction. So there's no learning going on about how you uh, orient the edges. Is there? So you you can you evaluate the the, the orientation to see if it's good. <coughs> Isn't that what the neural nets are for in between the nets? So you orient one way. Yeah. See how well you can generate data given that, given that model way. of the world. Right. You do the other, and I guess you learn which one was better at. Right. So how do you go from one orientation to the next? Is that what the CGNN you just trained is telling you? Um, or is it just telling you whether this orientation is better than the previous one? You mean the first? Step or the final? Yes. The first one? Uh, I mean the first one. Okay. The first step, you're just seeing whether um, one orientation is better than the other between pairs of variables. Okay. So it's isolated, like only x1, x2, and then like each two pair. Each two in, pair. In isolation. Right. And then in step three, mm -hmm. you are randomly picking edges. Okay. Evaluating, reversing an edge and evaluating that orientation globally. Right. And so that's another case where you might see um, that reversing an edge improves the global score. Okay. Uh, when you reverse an edge, you're just reversing edges randomly, though? In this formulation, yes. So you're saying you could be uh, adding some intelligence into what edges you're, you're changing? And you could have some kind of like taboo search or genetic algorithm to help uh, guide that. Yes. Okay. Cool. Thank you for walking me through that. Uh oh. -uh. No problem. Can I just toss in a thought? If anybody else has a question. Um, so, and I know this is not a perfect solution, but can we uh, can we localize the graph like? Um, so you have this huge graph that has relationships. When we look at somewhere, try to optimize that, then move to a sort of a next one. And then so, so imposing some sort of hierarchy on the, on the graph. And yeah. then only like at the, at the global stage, we only look at the local graphs. Um, if you repeat it enough, we may cut the cost by the model, whatever it is right now. Wasn't that the second discussion point? Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, but I'm, I'm trying to address it. Oh, okay. But, but the solution wasn't in the discussion. Okay, so what is your solution? Uh, impose some hierarchical sort of structure to the graph, okay. on the graph, right? So say... Well, the solution was there. So you uh, the ponder solution. sampling the nodes, or just localizing the nodes? Localizing the graph. Yeah. So you have, um, so look at um, different locales in the graph. Um, compute things locally, because that will bring down the cost. Um, and then for the global score, number three, uh, you can just look at the <coughs> interactions of your locales. Um, sounds like you want a cluster. Your clustering, how it works, will really depend on the directionality of your edges. And what you're going to, like, let's just, it sounds like you want to split the graph in the related things, saying, yeah. related clusters. I mean, sure, if you want to call it that. But cluster, like, when you say cluster, yeah, uh, you, you cluster that, right? Not the graph, but sure. But I mean, yes. With an undirected graph, your clustering will work differently than it will with a directed graph. And you'll get a directed graph out of this, which kind of puts two before one in a way that doesn't really make sense here. You may actually be able to confirm something later with a clustering step. With once you have your directed edges, I don't know if that would work. But originally, you start with an undirected graph, and your clustering won't necessarily give you what so, I think you want. So I think what you're missing is, and and I I'll be more like I put it out there. I already have a couple of criticism on it. 
So I'm, I'm, I am receiving your criticism, but I think what you're missing is that it's undirected for one, yep. for three is directed already. Right? Yeah. And I'm, I'm saying that you go through one, that's not too, too costly as compared to three, right? Um, you do initialize your graph, um, and then you form your clusters, if you may. Um, and then for the global, because you're going to do that iteratively, right? Um, you just um, compute the interactions in, in, inside the clusters, and then from the clusters to the rest of the graph. What, what I think Ashley's point is that if you do that clustering, once you get to the directed graph, then those clusterings are not useful Because now, is that right? Because of the directionality, now there, there might be a different clustering. <coughs> Your clustering will keep changing every right. single time you do this iteration in three. As you reverse directions of things, and then, uh-oh, now A isn't next to B anymore. Yeah, well, why would they keep, like, in, in, inside they're, they're changing, for sure. With a directed graph, like, you're essentially going to walk the graph, and then you're going to keep biting things that are close to it, right? right? But, like, if you reverse edges, the walks don't work the same way. Yeah. And you end up in different places, which means your closeness isn't the same. And that will create a challenge in that stage. It doesn't mean that you don't keep trying different reversals, and then you, because clustering is relatively inexpensive, depending on your, your algorithm. So you could keep doing clustering and see if clusters stay relevant and essentially keep converging as you keep going. But I, I don't know if it, I'd have to see it to feel like, yeah, yeah. this is gonna lead us the right way. Um, it may just be a graph cuts problem because like you end up with your skeleton, you start with a skeleton that you kind of already situated, let's be honest. like. An unlearned skeleton would be very interesting to see here. And like, because you can just cut intelligently along certain <coughs> edges that are essentially connecting two large clusters already that are directed and they would stay close. Right. I think you would, you could definitely paralyze along cuts, cuts and see what happens. The challenge, however, will be these, in most of these cases, I think these examples don't take into account that the updates at, on the edges in the real world actually happen at the same time. And therefore the effect of developing this causal relationship isn't, isn't actually representative of the real world. It, it kind of looks like it, but it won't be. So it, the graph is way more complex than I think you learn. So, um, so then my question is, and people please jump in. I don't want them to go on for, for too long. But, my question is then: How is how is cutting the graph different from uh, like having your localized? Uh, um, I, I kind of qualified it at the very beginning. It depends on whether you're doing clustering on a like a directed graph or an undirected graph. And at the very beginning, your cut to create your clustering will happen on an undirected graph, and therefore you'll get a different looking cluster than you would on a directed graph. Um, Also, there are other ways of detecting the modularity of your graph. Like there are a bunch of different clustering algorithms that might actually get you some representative things. Just the way I was thinking about it, though, like the big difference is definitely as soon as you get a DAG. Yeah, I can't see it. One question. So let's say we have this simple, like two clusters of graph, which are connected only with one edge, which is the simplest way. You have the minimum cut edge, and then the direction of this one changes. Now, before we were saying that okay, this side generates this side, causes this side, and then now it's like this side yeah. is causing this side. Yeah. So everything changes. Yeah. Now. That's. I, is that? Some, is that what you were? Yeah. That's okay. Really good way. Yeah. So that that was the criticism that I had in mind because like you don't really know that then how your clusters would interact. Um, sure. And that might have already changed by the time. Um, maybe we can come up with a way that we can sort of... So uh, one way would be like minimizing that SID, so cut the points which are, which have like the minimum SID, minimum uh, intervention distance. So maybe that's, that would be the best. Yeah. Seems like, but the other challenge is then, 
how do you want to cut it when the graph hasn't evolved into something meaningful? Right? So I think you have to wait. Like you have to go through those iterations quite a few times. Um, and then start. But Could, couldn't that lead you to get stuck in local minimums then? Because once the graph is starting to evolve some structure and then you start putting the cuts in, you're liable to get locked into something that's suboptimal. Maybe you should cut and sometimes randomly join them. Oh, we are talking about genetic algorithm. <laughs> 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 I feel that was intentional. No. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> there is another formulation of the algorithm where you relax the causal sufficiency assumption. Uh, so you're saying your x's may not be everything that's important in this structure. And in that formulation, then you introduce additional terms that represent relationships between pairs of variables. And so you can add or remove those extra variables to represent, say, in my skeleton, I may not have captured everything, but there could be something that's acting on multiple factors in the graph. Yeah. This would be a way of encoding different information, potentially. I want to say this last thing and then the others. Um, even if you look at, look at like, let's say you have all these nodes in your graph, uh, just computationally speaking, um, even you at each point in time or at each iteration, you, you let one, um, you pick one node in your graph to interact with the rest of the, with the, rest of the graph um, out of the local cluster. Um, that's still much more efficient than every node in that cluster interacting with every node in, in the graph. So I, I think what I'm saying is that you can put mechanisms in place and then we, can, we have to see experimentally. Theoretically, I think we got it out how, how things could go wrong. And when you say interacting with every node in the graph, do you mean so, drawing an edge between one node and every potential node? Oh, okay. No. So okay. change in it and then look at the entire graph and look at the global score. Okay. That's what I mean. Okay. For it. So instead, just evaluating local scores even in the iterative step. Yeah. Potentially. It should help with that. Um, because I think I think both then because because I think part of the problem that we sort of pointed out. Um, Actually, Masood also did that. You, like, there could be some relationship. Uh, by the time you update the graph, it may or may not be there anymore. So maybe we can randomly walk through those edges in turn um, and um, so at, at each iteration, as opposed to um, looking at the entire graph and just globally update the scores all the time. I guess that was probably partly their idea by randomly sampling versus picking an edge and then just traversing. Yeah. So, step one. <laughs> yeah, step one. Anyone uh, else has a question? Uh, um, this is less about specific algorithm and more about uh, causal functional models in general. Uh, and if it's out of scope, just let me know. But when you're talking about these models and trying to infer causal relationships for very large numbers of data, for very large numbers of variables, right. especially in domains where you're not sure there's structure in them, like say finance, uh, or I think about the case of genome sequencing and anything beyond having one gene as a cause of something is almost impossible to figure out just because the, the search space is so huge that any patterns you find are most likely to just be kind of patterns out of thin air. Uh, so is this something that's kind of discussed in this kind of literature or 
is it common in experiments to try to get a sense of uh, what kind of real patterns you're identifying, how many false positives you're picking up? Is there, is there any discussion around this? Not, at least in my reading, I'd say not exactly. For cases, the genetic case is huge and seemingly intractable. Yeah. Um, most of how they were validating these algorithms was on in cases where there is prior knowledge, so you can compare what the algorithm found to what you know to be true. Um, so yeah, uh, sorry, I, I have forgot <laughs> the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, what you said where they're mostly evaluating where you have prior knowledge right. pretty much answers it. They're not just throwing data that they don't oh. have a priori understanding of at the algorithm saying find me the causal inference here. Or right. The, causal the other thing I was thinking was if they have a hypothesis, then they might use this model to narrow down which randomized controlled trials they will do to test that hypothesis. So you have all the edges being, or all the variables being things that you could intervene on and see how it impacts your system, but you train this model to figure out the two or three as opposed to the 20 that you might want to intervene on because you think that based on how the data is distributed, it might have this effect. So it's just shrinking your search space, but still using a control trial to validate your hypothesis. If it is available. Not in the genetic case, obviously. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, just given in more general cases, we usually are not sure if we are observing all the variables, like all the all the causes. Mm -hmm. So that's another source of error because we don't know what is causing. So let's say we come up with a with, with a DAG, and then we don't know if these two variables are caused caused by like individual things or not. So even after doing everything, still, if we don't have uh, the knowledge, we don't know if this is correct or not. Hi everybody, welcome to TDLS. I'm Lindsay, I'm one of the members of the steering committee. If you liked the video you just saw, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll be the first to find out about every video we put out.